Today we begin a, a sermon series through the book of Colossians, one of Paul's letters, uh, a shorter of his letters, but one that we want to spend some time in because it has some important things to say. So let's begin in the book of Colossians, the first chapter, reading the first 14 verses. This is what God's word says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, the hope and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is producing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The other day, the staff got together for our Christmas party. And one of the things that we asked them to do was to respond to the statement, my best Christmas present of all time was. It produced a bit of thanksgiving, I think, in some hearts because we heard everything from pictures of children to spouses or engagement rings to stuffed animals and tricycles. And people began to share stories about why these gifts were particularly important in their life. And it's amazing to hear that when, when an individual who is an older adult now, and I'll leave it at that, was five, they got a tricycle. And how important that tricycle was to them. Or how someone got a baby doll with hair. Because there's so many kids in the family, there were always little kids, and they, they, they weren't able to have the ones with hair because the little ones might pull it out and choke on it. And one Christmas, they got a baby doll with hair, and how excited they were. You know, th this whole mood of gratitude is, is quickly dissipating in our country, and, and that saddens me. My wife is probably one of the most gracious and grateful people I know. She always remembers to say thank you and has inspired that in our boys. They get excited about anything people do for them. And that's an attitude that, that does not come as naturally to me. So when we get to this text, it's, it's a reminder that I need to have an attitude of gratitude, to change how I approach people, and to change how I say thank you. Let's be real. There's a spectrum of people, aren't there? Some people are wonderful at acknowledging kindness, whether it's with a thank you that is written or often spoken. Others, well, they're more of the private appreciative type. They may never say thank you out loud, but they simply keep it in their heart. I think in some of those cases, those folks feel like they're not worthy of whatever you've done for them. So they have a hard time saying thank you. 
But Paul takes time at the beginning of this letter, as he does in some of his other letters, to be very intentional about saying to the people of Colossae, thank you. Not for what they've done for him. He's never even met them. He is thanking them for their response to God, for the way God is working in their lives. So we want to take a moment, we want to look at um, a piece of what we just read. Oh, it helps when I turn this thing on, doesn't it? There we go. We want to look at verses 3 to 5a. Let me read this to you again. Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. Let's unpack this a little bit before we get on to the application piece. First of all, the you in these texts is all plural. You see, Paul is addressing this to a church, a group of people, not to individuals. Here at Christ Church, we are part of the body of Christ. Yes, we are made up of individuals, but let's be honest, we can accomplish things as a church that the individuals can't. And quite honestly, we can accomplish more as a group than a sum of the individuals. There's a, a theory or a, an attitude in art called the, the gestalt uh, approach. I'm not sure you're familiar with it. But, but gestalt is all about how the, the whole is so much bigger than the sum of its parts. You see, you could give me canvas, paint, brushes, and all the time in the world, and I would not come up with a Rembrandt. I would come up with some paint on a canvas that was, looked more impressionistic and ridiculous than anything else. Rembrandt had the ability to put paint on a canvas with brushes in a way that was just amazing. Adding up the people at Christ Church is not the same as who Christ Church is. Christ Church is, is a part of the body of Christ that functions in such a way that amazing things happen because of this church. It's not about adding up what each of us does, gives, offers, but somehow God works through the community in a larger way. I want you to keep that in mind because I think sometimes we think a church is really just a sum of each of the individuals and it's so much more than that. We hear in this text now it is, does Paul pray for the church as a whole? But he also talks about their response. He talks about faith, love, and hope. And, and really, in his mind, they kind of go in a different direction. They really are about the hope first that they encountered. Now, the theological idea of hope is not just, boy, I really hope I get what I want for Christmas, or I hope I win the lottery. Hope as a Christian doctrine has very little to do with today. It has everything to do with what's coming down the road. And my guess is, if you're anything like me, the thing that first inspired you to come to faith was this notion that someday I'm going to stand before God. And when I stand before God, all I have is my sinful self. And that's not going to cut it. But that because of the work that Christ did on the cross... When God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ, and I'm going to be offered eternal life in God's presence. You see, that's the hope that we have as followers of Christ, that this life is not all there is, and that when we die, that that's when true life begins. That's the Christian doctrine of hope. And because we have, we have been shared that gospel, that Christ's blood can put us in good standing with God and we have hope of eternal life, 
that begins then to germinate and to grow in us. And it produces plants called faith and love. The faith then becomes our part of saying, Father, I don't know exactly how this is all going to work, that you are going to forgive me through the blood of Christ. I'm just glad it does. So, Father, in faith, I accept Christ as my Savior. And as a result, now I know that this hope is a part of my future. It's a guarantee, Scripture says. And, And we know it's a guarantee because he puts a deposit of that in our lives now called the Holy Spirit. If we have the Holy Spirit, we know the hope is there. That faith response is a response to hope. And it also produces love. See, that's what this text is saying. Paul is thankful for their faith in Jesus Christ and for the love they have for all God's people. Where did that come from? It came out of this hope that Epaphras preached to the church in Colossae. So it kind of looks like this. Faith is produced out of our hope. And love also comes out. As a result then, he is saying to the church at Colossae, I'm just grateful for what you've done, for the way you've responded. The next step for most of us is that we begin then to give. I don't know about you, but when I came to faith, the notion that I had eternity with God in front of me and that he was working in my life, produced not just love in me for other people, but began to produce a sense of generosity, of giving to others. I wanted to share the gospel with them. I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to to care for others and give to others. When I was in college, I uh, was about to go home for Christmas one year, uh, my freshman year, and I had a friend by the name of Rex. Rex was a, was a brother in Christ and had spent a lot of time kind of pouring energy into my life. And he said, so what are you going to ask for this year for Christmas? And, and at Ohio University, where I attended, we got off from the day before Thanksgiving till a few days after New Year's. It was cool. We had time to get jobs over Christmas and things like that. And so there was going to be a long break there. And he said, what are you going to ask for? And I said, boy, you know, Rex, I really, I really want an NIV Bible. You know, I'm, I'm using a living Bible to study under, out of, and I've had it for a long time, but I, I just really want a good translation I can really dig into and really get a handle on God's Word. He said, that's, that's a good idea. Well, that was probably a week or so before we left on break, and the, about the day before I left my freshman year, Rex showed up at my door and knocked on the door, and he handed me an NIV Bible. He said, ask for something else for Christmas Here. Now, I don't know how Rex afforded that on a college student's income, because I know I didn't have much money at that time, and I assume he didn't either. He probably sacrificed to give me that gift. I still have that Bible. I used it for a while, and then I got this one that um, has kind of seen better days. You know, the cover's kind of falling off, and it's torn, but um, I worked hard helping somebody build an underground house Not that I was the brains, I was the back. He was the brains, I did what he told me. Anyway, that Bible then got passed off to my grandmother. And she used it for a while. Then when she passed, it came back to me, and I still have it in my office. But you know, when we experience hope and faith and love, it often results in giving. As a result of Rex's gift to me, I... I cannot tell you how many Bibles I have purchased and given to people. The one I do remember was as a result of a phone call I had with a lady who was living in Poland. She was asking me theological questions, and I could tell she didn't have good resources at her fingertips. So I went and purchased a a, a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, hardback, and I put it in a box along with some other things, and I shipped it to Poland. That Bible now resides in my house because that lady became my wife. 20 years ago. You see, when God impacts us, we tend to overflow and we want to share. We want to give. And that's what it's all about. Now, we we heard this morning, today is Epiphany. And you have these, 
this story of wise men coming. We always talk about three wise men because there are three gifts, but let's be real. Scripture doesn't say how many there were. We know there were more than two, or there were at least two, because the word in the text is plural. So there were at least two wise men, but we don't know that there were three. That doesn't cost you any extra. You can go home and regale your friends with your vast knowledge of Scripture. Hey, you know, it doesn't really say there were three. Anyway, they show up in hopes that this star that they've seen that indicates that somebody important has been born, their hope is that this is going to be the Savior of the world. When they encounter Jesus, much like we all have, something happened in them, and they gave. They gave gold, frankincense, myrrh. They were costly gifts, and as a result... The Holy Family was able to subside, or able to, to escape to Egypt and live on the sustenance of those gifts for quite a while. They gave in response to what God had done in their lives. Paul is thanking the Colossians because of what has happened in their lives. They gave. Which then begs the question, what's happening in our lives? There's a we have, we have encountered this king, this Messiah, this Savior, much like the wise men have, and, and they gave, and then often that inspires us to give. There's a song by Ray Bolts. It's an older song. Kim's playing the chorus, or the chords, on the piano, and, and maybe you've heard it. If I was Sam, I would stand up here and sing it, but I'm not. And I don't want to empty the sanctuary in like three seconds flat. So I'm going to share with you some of the words. It says, dreamt I went to heaven. You were there with me. We walked along the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing. Then someone called your name. You turned and saw a young man. He was smiling as he came. He said, friend, you may not know me. But then he said, but wait, you used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. Each week you would say a prayer before class would start one morning. When you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad you gave. Then another man stood before you. He said, remember the time a missionary came to your church? His pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Jesus took that gift you gave, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad you gave. One by one they came, as far as the eye could see. Each one somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done, sacrifices made, unnoticed on earth. Heaven now proclaims. Do you hear what's going on? It's not that you gave millions and that's why I'm here. It isn't even about the money. It's about this attitude, this willingness to give whatever we have. And it impacts other people. You know, I often say that I love to mow grass and blow snow because when I'm done, I can point to it and say, see, I did something today. Because so many times in ministry, we don't know. We strive to care, we strive to give, and, and sometimes we hear stories way down the line of a seed that was planted way back at the beginning. You know, it was years before I realized that my journey of faith began under Mrs. Shakley and Mrs. Negley, and I went back and thanked them. But it was probably 20 years before I went back and thanked them. It was years before I recognized that Mrs. Myers spoke into my life in youth group, as did Mrs. Stevens, and I went back and thanked them. But it was years in between. 
Sometimes we forget to go back and say thanks. And sometimes we give and have no idea of the impact that it has for God's kingdom. Everything that we do, God can use. This church, I have heard stories upon stories upon stories of how Christ Church has had an impact. I think my favorite one was when I was talking to someone um, on the cross-country course one day. We were getting ready to watch the kids run, and I was trying to find a spot where I could get good photographs, and this mother was doing the same with her husband. And I said, um, which team does your child run for? And they said, oh, Franklin. I said, oh, so does my son. I said, but we're new here, so I don't know most of the kids on the team. This was one of the first meets of the year. And, and so she pointed out her, her son and daughter, and I pointed out my son. And, and um, she said, why did you move here? I said, well, I'm the new pastor at Christ Church in Franklin, Christ United Methodist on Buffalo. And her response was, oh, that's the church that does amazing things for children. You know, isn't that wonderful? Because sometimes I say, I serve such and such a church, and they go, oh, <laughs> that church. I knew people that went to that church. And you just, you just pray that God will give them permanent amnesia <laughs> so that they don't remember the pain. I've heard stories of, of this church caring for children. I've heard stories of this church caring for people in time of financial crisis and coming alongside them. I've heard stories of this church standing with people as they struggle with their health or their marriage or as they struggle with depression or anxiety. Some of those stories warm my heart. I love to hear stories of, of people caring for one another. But you know, so often we hear those stories and we forget to go back and say thank you. Sometimes those thank yous belong at the door of Amy Smith as she cares for kids, or they belong at the door of Jonathan Smith as he cares for youth, or they belong at the door of Katie Aaron as she has welcomed people in as they come in a little in fear and trepidation first time to church and they see this smiling face that welcomes them. Sometimes that thank you belongs up in the sign booth, booth with Matt Wagner because people love the fact that they can tune in and get the service. People tell me all the time, I'm going to Florida for six weeks, but I will watch you every week. I'm thinking, really? You're going to Florida? You got time for that? Okay. I would think they could find more exciting preachers down there to watch, but perhaps they just love their church family. But you know, the one group that we often fail to thank is you guys. Let me be honest with you a minute. We are positioned in 2019 to ask some really exciting questions. Like, God, where do you want us to go next? We see all the stuff that we're doing, Lord, but is there something you're calling us to do that we haven't thought of? And we get to do that for one simple reason. You guys have been incredibly generous. I don't first have to ask the question of the staff, yeah, but if we do that, how are we going to pay for it? My question is, what's God calling us to do next? Because I know that we are already in a position to fund new creative ministry. That's thanks to you guys. That's thanks to your generosity. That's thanks to your faithfulness. That's thanks for the way you have loved and cared. You have allowed God's hope to produce faith and love in you, and that has resulted in giving. That's exciting. You see, I knew that was going to be the case when I came here because I cheated. For 11 years, I've listened to stories. You cannot imagine. Maybe you can, but let me tell you. Pastor David Jans was so excited when you guys bought some houses, tore them down, and expanded a parking lot. He got so excited. He got so excited when the bishop said, we're going we're gonna to build our camps up. 
and we're going to try to raise $5 million in five years. David came to Covenant Group with his chest puffed out and said, I am so proud of my church. You can't believe the financial commitment they've made to the camps. And they were so gracious. They didn't just worry about our Methodist camps. They also said, you know what? We got a place in our heart for Seneca Hills. We don't want them left out. We want to support them too. He was so proud of what you had done. So I cheated. I knew that's what I was coming into. And I started to get excited. Lord, this is going to be an opportunity for us to think outside the box. To not have to have the financial conversation before we do anything else. We can just dream and say, Lord, what's next? How do you want to use... Yes, it's going to come through the individuals. How do you want to use the body known as Christ United Methodist Church in Franklin to further impact the Franklin community, the greater Franklin region, the world, literally, through ASP, through our giving, through, through our touching of folks like Calm and the folks there. Lord, how else do you want to use this group of believers who are striving to listen to your voice and give? How do you want to use us to impact others? I can't imagine what he's going to come up with. I'm praying fervently that on Tuesday he begins some of those conversations with the staff so that we can then come to the rest of the leadership and say, what's God saying to you? This is what we seem to be hearing. Can we work together? Well, we're entering 2019 with a whole new opportunity in front of us. There may be some things that we do in ministry that are getting in the way of what God wants us to do next, that we need to kind of shift to one side or the other. I don't know, but I can't wait to see where we go. But in the meantime, I want you to hear from me a resounding thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your love for others. Thank you for your financial gifts that make all of this possible. Thank you that you care enough to get on board and say, Lord, we can't wait to see what you're going to do next, and we want to be a part of that. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, as Paul thanked the folks at Colossae, I thank you for the folks at Christ Church, for their faithfulness, for their graciousness, for their generosity, for the way, Father, that they dream big dreams and then watch you bring them to completion. Whether the big dreams are a larger team to ASP, more opportunities to reach children in the community, more groups for adults to connect to so that they can get what they need, more ways to come alongside those that are struggling so that we can help them. Father, thank you for this body of Christ, for the way they make a difference every day in the lives of people in Franklin and in the lives of people around the world. Continue to bless them, Father. Continue to speak into their lives. Continue to show them where you want to go with them next. We ask us all in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.